All right, so yesterday we talked a little bit about the view piece. Um, specifically, we build out this messages and the message components. So um, I've actually gone ahead and refactored the messages. So yesterday we had everything, um, all of the lifecycle methods in here, like get initial state, uh, component did mount, or, and component will unmount. Well, it turns out we, we use those in all of the components that work with the, uh, the stores. So I've extracted out that functionality into a mix-in. Um, and that mix-in just says, uh, the, it's the storekeeper mix-in and it says, just go ahead and define the stores that you care about, the ones that you wanna to listen to, and then give me a method that helps us figure out our initial state. And then the mix-in takes care of the rest. So if you want to take a look at that code, it's in the storekeeper JS. Just four methods. It's the same four methods we wrote yesterday. Um, so I'll leave that if you want to go take a look at it. Uh, I wanted to kind of focus on the actions and probably the stores today, just to give you an idea of how I might update the messages. So yesterday we built this. Um, when I click on the login, it gives me this missing credential. So it's adding a message um, because I didn't add any login information here. Those messages are coming back from the server, but one thing that's kind of obnoxious is that they stay here. So when we left yesterday, I'd added a delete button here, but then I went out and read some more of the material UI design guidelines, and they kind of discourage that they sort of indicated that these messages should disappear on their own. And, and in fact, that actually turns out to be relatively easy to do um, with React. So we're gonna walk through a little bit of that. So here I have this API.js. Uh, this is the method that gets, or this is the, the class that encapsulates the code that talks to the server. Uh, inside of here, whenever, um, I get a response back from the server. We're gonna take a look at that code. Um, so for, let me just walk through it really quick. So I do a post out to the server, it calls this do request. So the do request checks to see, have you made this request before? And if you do, stop that request. Um, because we don't wanna, if the user clicks the button multiple times, we only wanna have one of those requests actually do anything. Um, and then it restores off, or it stores off the pending requests and then when the request um, gets ret is returned, we're gonna um, call this dispatch response. So request.end means that the asynchronous call out to the server has completed and we're gonna pass information to this dispatch response. All right, so in dispatch response, um, we can take a look at this. So this is the function that's actually gonna get called. We'll look at the error and we'll look at the response. If there is an error and the error was timeout, we're gonna dispatch a timeout action so that somebody, the this code doesn't actually need to care who takes care of it, but somebody has to take care of the timeout message. If we get a status code of 400, we can do a not authorized. And if everything is not okay, we can do an error. If everything is okay, we can just dispatch the response um, using the original key, which would have been the, the constant value from the original action. Um, and then of course we can add other error handling in here. So maybe in here we care about a status response of a 404. So we can capture that and then send that out um, as well. Yeah, do you really want this thing to abort pending requests? Because this kind of implies there's only one Ajax call going on at a time? No, it, it aborts pending requests based on the key. So if the uh, same exact request is made multiple times, it will stop the second request. In observable speak, this is similar to a switch latest. Um, right, and I'm just wondering, are you using some internal plumbing that's already in place, like the underscore pending requests, or is this stuff no, you've written? This is all stuff that, uh, well, so pending requests just stores off the ah, existing so it's stuff requests. you've written. Okay, got so it. So that's stuff that I've created. Um, the actual request object comes from super agent. 
right which is where the abort call comes from so right. we can call so super agent allows us to call that abort okay so the i mean you might have a situation where you don't want that to happen in which case i would refactor this code right here and say uh, mm -hmm. here's a situation where i yeah. do care that the every single request to the exact same api with the exact same data um, succeeds yeah, and in this particular case with this form, the UI interaction you actually want is probably to disable this the login button rather than let them click it lots of times, right? Correct, and that would be you know more of the the API sugar that we would deal with later on. Right. So. Well, it wouldn't even hit the API, right? Uh, uh yeah. I I mean that. So, like inside of here, you would want you would monitor the messages store or a different store that would indicate here are pending requests and if there's already a pending login request then you would disable i'm sorry that this is the wrong component then you would disable this button but that that's starting to get into more of the actual polish on the application and yeah, I want yeah, to yeah focus more on the implementation of this specific part of the api um okay so we're getting messages, well, rather, we're getting constants dispatched. That does not necessarily mean that there has to be a message. It just means that um, something happened, for example, a timeout or a not authorized or an error, and anybody who cares, any of the stores, rather, who care to listen for that can then do so. In our case, the messages store is going to be uh -huh. the one to listen for those specific constants. So you can see right here, um, this, this store, the messages store, has registered with the dispatcher. It's receiving or it's caring about the different constants like timeout, not authorized, and error, and so forth. And then when it does that, it says, I'm going to add a server message with this, with the data that's come back from the server, which is basically just going to be error output. Now we can formalize this in a lot of different ways to say, well, the server always has to return a JSON payload that looks exactly like, like some specification that we come up with. But for now, it's just returning data that we can then parse um, and then pull a message off of. So that's where the, the error messages are coming from. Uh, so again, that's gonna look just like this. I hit this, I get this missing credentials because that's the message that's coming back from the server. Now what I'd really like to do is to make those things disappear. Um, now I've debated back and forth whether this little piece of code should live in the actions or if it should live here in the message store and I'm kind of leaning towards it living inside of the message store itself. Uh, so Whenever I add a server message, I'm gonna say server messages are the ones that I want to have magically vanish. So after I add the message, I'm gonna add the set timeout. And let's say, leave the messages there for three seconds. You know, we can customize this and maybe the messages themselves could contain timeouts, uh, maybe depending on the type of message, they have different durations of timeouts. All of those things are, are refactors that we could do later on. But for right now, we're just gonna say, let it, let it stay there for three seconds. So I'm gonna say, let's create a message from this guy right here. And that's, what gets, that's what's gonna be put into the, the message queue. And then when we do this set timeout, I have to be able to pull that message back out. And right now, the messages um, object internally is just an array, which means I'm gonna have to do something like um, for messages.reject. Uh, now, I can't remember if, I don't think all the browsers are gonna support that. So let's, let's import, um, import Lodash. And now I have Lodash functionality that I can then um, call the reject, oops, I can call the reject method and 
I'm going to call it on messages. And let's see here. I'm going to change this really quickly. I'm going to make this same message. Make this same message. And now if message is equal to message, meaning if we found it in the array, then we'll, we'll pull it out. So now I can say messages is equal to that. All right, so this, um, this little bit of code right here is going to change the internal state of our data. And once that happens, we have to let everybody know that there was a change made. And we're going to do that with the, this init change method right now. Um, okay, so I'm going to drop that into this little piece of code right there. So now after adding this message, um, we're going to wait three seconds. Then we're going to pull that message right back out. And then we're going to tell the world that the store has changed, that we no longer have that message in our in our store. Okay. So now, explain to me. I mean, I thought this was a messages store. So why do we have an emit message on just the general store emit change? Oh, this that's because I've defined the store right here. It's uh, just the name I used. Yeah, I was thinking of those being classes when you're capitalizing them. They are. We could rename that to messages store if that makes it a little more clear what's going on. So it's the messages store that's okay. emitting the change. So the messages store is, is the object that's being exported from this file. It's the object where the views are going to go to get their data and it's the object that will emit the changes. Okay. Okay, so now and again, it's a singleton because these store, there's exactly, well, it's because we are only going to use the component in one place, right? Um, stores can be singletons, or you can declare them as instances. It just depends on how you want to, um, to implement them. Uh, different organizations do it differently, so... Trying to remember Yahoo with their Flux architecture, I think they implement them as instances, and the Airbnb guys do them as singletons. Um, singletons are simple and easy to deal with in this case. You can do instances if you wish to preload your stores with specific data, and if, then if for some reason you need more than one instance of a given store, you could you could add. Um, abstract things away that way. But a, a, single, a single store implies a single instance of the component, is that correct? A single instance of a component. Like so this, is, this, is, this is a messages component, right? This backs a messages component. Um, so. Yes, but I, I be careful about how tightly you couple components to stores. So a, a given component, a given React component, could listen to a hundred different stores. They aren't tied to the stores. They just get their data from a store. Right, but let's just play this instance, this example out. What if you had some messages at the top of the screen and some messages at the bottom of the screen? So you had two different instances of the messages component. This store could not deal with both of them because they would both listen. And well, you'd, you'd want to be cautious about how you implement that because in that case, I would come over to my messages component, my React messages component, and I would change where this guy gets his initial state. So right now, this guy is getting it from messages.current. But in the case where you wanted to reuse this messages component multiple places on a single page, then this guy probably should not have a get state method in him. Instead, that state should probably be provided to him by his parent. 
so that this component becomes reusable in the way that, that you want to reuse it. And then this state would be provided by maybe messages.top, and then you may might have a messages.bottom representing the messages that show up on the top of the page and the messages that show up on the bottom of the page. So um, in this case, this, this messages component becomes less reusable because it has state embedded inside of it. Um, and that's just an implementation detail. We chose to say this messages component really is only going to live in one spot on the page. But if we care about making this thing reusable, then um, what I would do is instead of this.state.messages, I would change it to props. And then, like I say, I would move this, all of this code, in fact, to some parent um, who would then provide the messages that this guy is responsible for rendering. Um, but why wouldn't you just do that always? Because we originally you talked about like separating the component, like making these reusable components. Like, well, why, why would you ever take this approach? Um, this is, it's just simpler this way. I mean, I, I take the approach that you build the component that you need right now. And then if I came in here and I, I looked at this thing and I said, oh, I would really like to be able to reuse this component in multiple places. I would then refactor the component so that I could make it reusable. And I would ask myself the question, what do I need to do to make this reusable? And that question usually begins with, how do I remove the state from this component? And I would do exactly what I just said. So I would I would pull out this code. I would pass the messages in right here. Then I would go and look and see where this thing is used, which I believe it's used in index.jsx right here. Uh, right there is the messages. So then um, messages gets passed as a property. And then I have to go get that somewhere. Well, where does that come from? Well, now this guy gets to care about the state. And so... Um, he might mix in the storekeeper uh, and, and care to listen to the messages store. And then I would say, all right, well, give me the top messages here. And then this guy right here would care about this.state.topMessages. And now I have a reusable messages component with a really minor refactor. Right. The place we started this whole conversation was actually back in the store where you're emitting the change. So let's follow this through back to there. Yeah, so we've got off on a, on a total tangent here. But but notice but, that there wasn't, I didn't have to go and change the messages store to make this happen. I well, it's not clear to me that you're done yet. Like, So let's keep following through what you've done. Let's go back to your store and say, explain how you would change things there. I wouldn't. Nothing changes here. Well, how do you say that this is a change, this a message that should go to the top or the bottom? So the store just says right here with emit change. The store just says I've changed. Whoever is listening, I've changed. Go do whatever you need to do. Okay. So there's no change to this guy. So the, so the store could be managing both the top messages and the bottom messages. This is just saying they're changed, so whoever's... Precisely. So you'd have two separate data structures, two different arrays. You'd have a top messages and a bottom messages. Yeah, so let, let's let's just demonstrate that. Let's work through that code just really quickly and, and then you can see. So let, let's test the first piece here, which um, you know we've gone through and, and done, uh, gone through and busted it. Let's see what we broke. Uh, so... <laughs> Oh, we refactored inside of the messages component and didn't put our code back. That's what happened. So that is going to come from state. Okay. So now I should be able to come click on sign in, log in. That's going to show up. And now it disappears. So we've actually accomplished um, kind of the pieces that I wanted to demonstrate today, which is simply that the components are simply reacting to changes in the data, even though the store gets to control this internally. Um, and I might, there's any number of ways I could handle this set timeout, one of which you might say, well, the store shouldn't be modifying its own state, so we could generate an action instead. 
So whenever I dispatch one of these actions, I could also dispatch, I could put a set timeout here so that I dispatch another action later on that says the message is now invalid, so please remove it. Um, I actually like it here because it's right next to where the messages are added and I think it feels um, a little closer to, to the source. Okay, so now, how would I refactor this? Let's, let's walk through that really quickly just to show this. So I've said we're going to pull this, um, the messages from the properties instead. We're going to move this out. And so now we're going to make this component reusable. We're going to say that the index is the guy who has to care about that stuff now. So um, the index is the parent of the messages component. And he is going to pass in the messages as a proper... Now, when you popped over to index.js, I guess it confuses me a little bit. Like, where am I right now? This isn't a component, or is it? It is a component. It's the index component. It's a React component. Yep. It's one that... Um, so, in, in this case, index... JSX is sort of a special file inside of React Kindling. It is the Chrome of your application. So, let's see. But it is actually still a component. It is still a component. Everything is everything in the UI is a component, is a React component. It's just that the index.jsx file is the guy who has the route handler as one of his child components. And because we're using React Router, React Router is going to find that React Handler and it's going to put the contents of the current route into that Route Handler component. Okay. Um, and I, I've done it this way because messages, it's, it's my Rails experience showing through. In Rails applications, you typically have some kind of a flash message that sits at a top level and outputs um, everything that gets dumped into the flash. And so that's kind of what I'm going for here. Um, you could make this more specific to each component. Maybe maybe instead of having a general global messages output, you might want the login control, right? You yeah, if you think this... about form validators, they'll, they'll live with each form, with each input, right? Yeah, yeah, and the form validators actually do, and I'll show that here in a second if you'd like to see that. But the um, these are messages that are actually being returned from the server, like global errors that say things like, hey, I couldn't process this value that you sent me. Some, some horrible error occurred. Uh, you hope... You hope to be able to catch this in the client, and we just haven't written any of the validations in the login component yet. Um, so the, the message that we're seeing now, we would actually prevent that call from ever hitting the server. Uh, but it's, it's in those edge cases where something happens and everything falls apart. So let's output some kind of a message so that we can, we can deal with that. Um, okay. So I need to pull the storekeeper out of here. I also need to pull the messages store out of here and move it up to here. Now I have a problem because I have two things named messages. So I'm just going to call this messages store. And now I'm going to listen to the messages store right there. And then I care about the data coming from the messages store. So let's take a quick look and see how our refactor went. Uh, that looks right. This guy's getting an initial state from this messages store, and because we're mixing in the storekeeper, all of those lifecycle methods should be in place. Let's go see if this works. Uh, line 19, you've got a problem. Line 19. Okay. Now let's go see. Getting storekeeper is not defined in here. Not defined. Oh, because um, we changed the level of operating. I think. Oops. That's 
So index, and then so we need to go up the directory and grab the stores. Okay, so now let's try that. Uh, still the same problem. All right. So what's wrong with this path? Index this inside of components. I need to go up two directories. Mixins lives right here next to. Okay. So maybe I got it right this time. Still not right. Still can't find. Okay, does anybody see the paths where we're going wrong here? Mixins, storekeeper. So that one looks right. And the message is store. It's just like a single directory. Stores, messages. Yeah, it's not. I don't know. Something's wrong with the paths here, and I'm not seeing it. So. And you have to go up point to get mixes. That's what I was thinking. I was. You should be able to just say, "I'm in the current directory," and grab mixins. Oh. Right, because it's right next yeah. to it. So that's oh, yeah. Current directory mixins storekeeper, and then stores is up one directory. So I get stores. And then messages, which is this guy right here. Uh, let's see here. Storekeeper. No, we, hadn't, we didn't change storekeeper, so that should be fine. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, but this. Yeah, we could probably spend a bunch of time debugging it, but that's what the refactor essentially looks like. Uh, once we get the paths right. So now um, you're just moving who it is that cares about the stores just up the chain. Uh, in theory, you could have one single top level component care about the state. For example, index.jsx or the component that gets rendered into the route handler could be the one who cares about the state. And then he could just pass everything down into the children via properties. And that would be a perfectly acceptable, and in fact, a relatively clean way to do it. And that basically makes everything reusable based on the, the properties of the asset. Okay, I'll, I'll get this working and then upload the code, but hopefully that was helpful. Any questions? So I guess, you know, related to that though, is like, what are the principles around deciding who should be listening for the who should be listening for changes in the stores? Yeah, where do you, where do you, where do you listen? Where do you... Uh, I think it's entirely dependent on how far up the food chain you want to be. So I could have, if I wanted everything to be reusable, and I think that maybe that's the deciding factor. Do I want to be able to reuse this component in multiple locations? And when I do that, is the data going to be different? And if the answer to those two questions are yes, then that component should probably not be handling state from a store internally. Instead, it should depend on some parent component to provide that to it. So I'm just trying to, to think about that because, I mean, the way, the way I would, I mean, I'm still trying to understand the whole flux architecture, but you know, typically I would think of you wanting to be able to have, quote, instances of components. Right. In, that, that each own their own data. But the way you describe it, you're saying, well, no. Well, um, for example, with the, let's go to the 
login. Where's the login? login. Okay. So this login component reuses a whole bunch of components from Material UI, like mm -hmm. raise button, paper, text field. None of those components get any state, any data from any of our stores, right? They, there's no way because we, they're completely decoupled from it. We're using somebody else's library. So these are reusable over and over and over again. So here's an instance of a text field. Here's another one. Here's an instance of a link that comes from the React router. Here's an instance of a flat button, again, from Material UI. As long as um, I abide by, those, by that principle of the parent has to provide any data and any methods to me, that then I can write more components. So I could, you know, I could go out and write a button component, for example, and I could. So I guess that so. So the way that I'm interpreting that is that stores deal with data that's going to be coming. Like that's the entry point for data coming back from the server. Um, stores are the place where you keep all data in your application. So. Well, that's not entirely true because just like you pointed out with those those forms, like the data showing what is in the input field right now, it's it's there. Right. It's just it just hasn't come back from a, an action or a, a, a back from a, a dispatcher, I guess. So, um, in the let's see. Yeah, right here. I have data that's available to me on these text fields because the user input data into those text fields. But that does not in any way change the state of my application. Not, not directly, right? So typing in these text fields, if I were using Ember or Angular, those text fields would probably be bound to either some value on a controller or a, or a model. And that's where you get the two-way data flow. But with React and Flux, that is not the case. Typing in this text field has no impact whatsoever on the state of my application. Now, when some other user interaction occurs, now typing might actually be the user interaction that causes the event. In this case, it's a submission of this form that causes the event to occur. But however you architect that, however you decide to um, pull data in, that's, that's up to you as a developer. So maybe I do it on blur, or maybe I do it on text change if I'm building a, a type ahead, or maybe I do it on form submit. Any of those are fine. All right. In this case, when I submit the form, this handle login gets called. I then go to the, my action creator from user actions and I call a method login and I pass it the values that were provided from those forms. At this point it's up to the actions to uh, or up to the action creator to generate an action which is then going to hit the dispatcher or maybe it hits the server. In this case it actually will go out and hit the server. Uh, which then generates another action which hits the dispatcher. But all of that flows back into the store. And then this component could potentially have a get initial value and listen to data from the user store. And the user store might say, I have a valid current um, user. And if there's a valid current user, maybe the login disappears. So this guy could watch for that and disappear. That's an unlikely scenario. Probably the guy who's the parent of the login would cause that to happen. And or the, reouter, the React router would fire and, and route you to a different part of your application. But yeah, like this. But, but I saw a, a, a login where actually never As soon as I tap the hundreds, What's that? You're breaking up. Oh. Um, so some form that I was using today, as soon as I typed in the email address, it gave me a green 
checkbox, which I think was coming back. Anyway, but you know, there's yeah, there's a variety of scenarios. Yeah. So in well, we've got it all broken right now, but the the register component, for example, has all of those validations in it. Yeah. And so in that case, see, we validate the email, we validate password, and we, you know, we use this validator class to handle that. But it could, it could add a green checkbox to say yes, this this thing is valid. So, um, to some degree, I suppose that's an internal state on the component, but it it has no effect on the overall state of the application. I suppose it could. You could invalidate email. You could um, generate actions, like I could have user actions um, dot broadcast or email is valid or something like that. And then if somebody else in the application cared to know that, um, they, they could know that via a store. So a store would listen for this and then mark some internal flag that says, hey, the email the user entered is valid, and so you know, display balloons on the page or whatever. I don't know. All right. Hey. Anything else? All right. I'll I'll fix this and push it up. And we'll Thank you. Talk Thanks. To you.